Day 5. Where events unfold, the knot of the adaptation of Echo's work becomes tangled like that of King Gordius, and one sees how too much creativity sometimes suffocates itself. In the last part we have now found that the series The Name of the Rose has completely deviated from the original novel. The motivation of the authors of the series is understandable, but not always suitable for my taste. Let's take a look at what fate Umberto Eco has in store for his characters on the fifth day of the events. On this day the delegations are to meet for their dispute. On the way, Azzo observes how Malachias appears to be discussing something with Berna Gui. Azzo also notices that Gui is holding a document. However, he doesn't give it any further thought, but instead goes to the chapter house, where the conference is to take place. Azzo describes the hall very precisely, as well as the members of the delegations. He then writes down the arguments presented by each participant, which to put it here would make this review as long as the novel, which would be grossly contrary to custom. In any case, it is very interesting and gives the reader a further insight into the thought world of the 14th century. The political motives are also explained and who takes which side and why. The dispute doesn't go well, however, as both sides get angry. For the uninvolved observer, it turns out to be rather funny. The Gospel says Christ had a purse. Stop about that purse that you even depict on your crucifixes. How, I ask you, do you explain that our Lord, when he was in Jerusalem, went to Bethany every evening? If our Lord choose to sleep in Bethany, who are you to criticize his decision? You are mistaken, you old goat. Our Lord went to Bethany because he had no money to afford an inn in Jerusalem. You're a goat yourself, Bona Grazia. And what did our Lord eat in Jerusalem? Would you say that the horse who receives oats from his master to live is the owner of the oats? Ha! You see, now you're comparing our Lord Jesus to a horse. No, but you are comparing our Lord Jesus to a corrupt prelate at your court, your bastard. The quarrel grows more heated when a novice approaches William and tells him that brother botanist Severin wants to speak to him. William is able to get out of the conference for a brief moment and learns that Severin apparently found the book around which the mysterious events seem to be entwined in his laboratory. However, he cannot bring it because it's a strange book and dangerous. William has to come and take a look at it in the laboratory. However, he is now urgently ordered back to the meeting. William then makes a careless mistake because halfway back to the chapter house he calls after Severin who is hurrying away to make sure that nobody brings back these documents which all the monks gathered in the courtyard over here. Before that, William gave Azzo the hasty order to follow Jorge, 
who apparently overheard something of the conversation between the monk and Severin. But after William's thoughtless exclamation, Azzo notices that Remigius appears to be petrified, but then hurries away. Since Aimardus is following Jorge anyway, the Novice decides to follow Remigius. Since there is a heavy fog on that day, it's not that easy. Remigius goes to Severin's hospital, but the door there is already locked. Azzo thinks Severin is safe and makes his way back, encountering Benno of Uppsala, who says things that make it clear that he has been observing the investigative duo very closely over the past few days. He also knows that Berenga found something in the library and would like to know what. He also wants to learn more about the secrets of the library and feels that the knowledge stored there should not be withheld from the world. Azzo arrives back at the conference where things have calmed down a bit. William must now present his points of view, with Azzo noting how distracted his master seems about the thought that the book is finally within reach. Nevertheless, his lecture is quite eloquent, so that Bernard Gouy remarks that William should repeat it before the Pope in Avignon, which he refuses. At that moment, a guard comes in and whispers something in Gouy's ear. The conference is interrupted as the Inquisitor boastfully announces that he has arrested the man responsible for the horrific murders, but unfortunately not in time because something has happened. William's worst fears come true. Before the monk could talk to Severin, someone murdered him, hit him with the so-called Amila Sphere, a metal model of the planetary orbits on the head. As the other monks rush into the room, William looks at the corpse, looking for black marks on his hand, but realizes that Severin is wearing gloves. In addition, the laboratory is completely devastated. Gui's guards caught Remedius standing over the dead man, searching through the shelves. Actually, they were looking for him anyway because they were supposed to arrest him. Apparently, Salvatore made a confession under torture that night. Remedius runs to Malachias, who is standing with the other monks, and says something to him, to which Malachias replies, I won't do anything against you. After Remedius had been taken away, William asked that all the monks leave the room. Only he, Azzo and Benno of Uppsala stayed. Benno has previously told William that he was sure Malachias wasn't there when the monks came into the room. Then he suddenly appeared out of nowhere. He certainly didn't come through the door, but must have been here before and hid behind a curtain. This leaves two assumptions. Either Malachias has something to do with Severin's death, or at least he saw the murder. The three monks set about searching through the mess and discover that several books are lying around, some of them badly battered. What was Remigius looking for here so desperately? But the book, which William only saw once in the scriptorium, doesn't seem to be here. Then William draws his attention to the Amalar sphere, because suddenly the apocalypse comes back to his mind. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, then a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars were struck, so that they lost a third of their luminosity, and the day became darker by a third, and also the night. The emulary sphere broke when Severin was hit on the head, a third of the stars were hit. Again, the murderer seems to have followed a precise plan. Azzo then recaps the verses about the fifth trumpet and wonders where the next dead person will be found. The fifth angel blew his trumpet. Then I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. He was given the key to the shaft that leads to the abyss. And he opened the pit of the abyss. Then smoke rose up out of the shaft, as from a great furnace and the sun and air were darkened by the smoke from the shaft. Out of the smoke locusts came upon earth, 
and were given power as a thousand of scorpions have upon the earth. That's so much information that one can only speculate as to what's going on in the murderous sick mind. The monks do not find the book in question. William assigns Benno to monitor Malachias. On the way back to their cell, they think aloud again. It suddenly occurs to William that Severin called the book a strange book. And they had seen one like that, just didn't realize that it was the one they were looking for. This is what happened. William was looking for a Greek book. Atzo had found a book, but written in Arabic language. But sometimes, writings in different languages are bound together in one book. That's why Severin spoke of a strange book, because there were several languages together. They run back to the lab, but now the book is gone. Atzo remembers that Benno had a short laugh when he showed William the book and William angrily replied that it was the wrong one since the writing was Arabic. Benno didn't laugh because Azzo didn't recognize Arabic, but because William didn't realize he was holding the right book. William assumes that the book is now back in the library. Depressed, he and Azzo go to the chapter house, where the court hearing of the Inquisitor Bernagui is to take place instead of the dispute. Remigius is accused of murder and heresy. Bernagui plays the full range of what Schopenhauer called the art of being right. Everything is reinterpreted. Everything is loaded with meaning and interpreted in such a way that it fits Gui's assumptions. For example, since Remigius seems very calm and unaware of any guilt, Gui claims that this is precisely a sign of his guilt, since the righteous are always nervous. And had Remigius been nervous, the Inquisitor would have said that nervousness was a sign of guilt. In the course of the interrogation, the badly battered Salvatore is brought in, and the heretical past of both comes to light. Then Malachias is called, and we see why Remigius searched Severin's laboratory. Remigius entrusted Malachias with some documents related to his time at the gang of Fradolcino. When William told Severin that morning to worry that no one would bring back these documents, Remigius assumed they were his documents. However, Remigius is still claiming that he did not kill Severin. When Gui asks William what documents he meant by his statement, William replies with a play on words. It was a book about rabies in dogs. Gui understands the remark. He is a Dominican monk. The word Dominican is derived from Dominicanes, meaning sleuth dogs of the Lord. Instead, Gui tries to get a confession from Remigius that he can use to blow up the conference and frame the Franciscans as heretics. He has one trump card. The documents of Remigius given to him by Malachias are Fra Dolcino's final instructions to his followers, written by the heretic leader in case the Inquisition catches him. If the time had been right, Remigius should have given these documents to various groups of Dolcino's followers. Now that he has no longer to deny his true identity, Remigius confesses his entire heretical past, even seeming so strangely enraptured that he repeats the calls for murder and manslaughter. But there is one thing he does not want to admit, the murders of the monks in the monastery. Azzo critically notes that Gui has no interest in solving the murder cases. He just wants someone to blame. And he gets that when he tells Remigius what awaits him over the next few days. Torture. Looking at the mistreated Salvatore, Remigius confesses all the murders and invents a motive for each one. Finally, he even says that he made the devil serve him to carry out the murders. With that, the Inquisitor has the cellarer taken away. The dispute failed. Bernard now has his sight set upon Ubertin of Casale, who has also made heretical speeches. 
William advises Ubertin to flee, which he does. Only Michael of Cesena, who leads the Franciscan delegation, wants to travel to Avignon to see the Pope. Since there is nothing else to do, William wants to at least solve the murder cases. But in the meantime, a new problem has arisen. Benno of Uppsala, who undoubtedly got the book from Severin's laboratory, was offered the post of Berengar as an assistant librarian. This gives him access to all the mysteries he so desperately wanted to explore. For this reason, he gave the book to Malachias. William explains to Azzo that Benno, like Berengar, was seized by a lust. With Berengar, it was the lust of the flesh. With Benno, it's the lust for knowledge. But contrary to his earlier statements, that the knowledge must be available to everyone, it is now enough for him if he can access this knowledge on his own. At the service that follows, Jorge of Burgos preaches a sermon on knowledge, the preservation of knowledge and the Antichrist. Azzo and William then talk about the fate of Remedius, Salvatore and the Rose. They will go to Avignon with Bernard, but William estimates that only Remedius will get there. Salvatore is not important. Maybe Gui will let him escape and then have him killed while trying to escape. The pyre for the Rose will be built somewhere along the way to act as a spectacle and deterrent to the populace. Remedius will be sent to the stake in Avignon, just in time for the arrival of Michael of Cesena, so that a Pope has a reason to fight against the Franciscans. Azzo notes bitterly, So the cellarer is right, it's always the little people who have to pay. Pay for everyone, even for those great people who speak in their favor, even for people like Ubertin of Casale and Michael of Cesena, whose appeals for penance made them revolt. I was far too desperate to consider that my girl had not been a heretic at all who let herself be seduced by Ubertin's mysticism. She was a simple peasant girl and had to pay for something she had absolutely nothing to do with. That evening Azzo cries in his bed. He remembers novels of chivalry that he read as a boy and would have liked to indulge in the courtly love of those stories. But that's not possible, because this love includes sighing the name of your loved one and knowing that you will never be with her. And with the realization that he doesn't even know the name of the rose, the report of the day ends. The movie has to shorten the events once again and incorporates a few inconsistencies in the process. Also. The conflict between William and Bernard Gui is exacerbated. The arrest of Salvatore and the Rose was like in the novel. We also see Salvatore being tortured by the henchmen of the Inquisition. Gui conveniently brought the instrument of tortures with him. After the papal delegation has arrived, the dispute takes also place here. The scene is greatly shortened compared to the novel and Bernard Gui is not there. But there are also heated discussions. Here too, Severin comes along and reports to William that he has found the book. However, he and William talk to each other through an open window in the chapter house. A monk, whose face cannot be seen, overhears them. Here too, William orders Severin to return to his laboratory and wait. The Franciscan wants to see him as soon as the dispute allows it. Now the inconsistency arises. Severin returns to his laboratory and finds it completely devastated. This is illogical, as the monk who overheard Severin and William barely had a head start on Severin to wreak havoc. In addition, the book is quite obviously there because Severin immediately discovers it under a table. As he arms himself with gloves and is about to pick it up, he discovers that someone is hiding behind a curtain. We see this person come out, grab the amillary sphere and slay Severin. But we don't see yet who it is. Then we see Remigius busy with a few servants. Malachias arrives and tells him that Salvatore has confessed the heretical past to the Inquisition and that he must flee. 
When Remigius tries to escape via the trapdoor through which the monastery disposes of its waste, Gui's guards are already waiting for him and arrest him. In another brief scene, we see that Malachias notices a drop of blood on his shoe, which he secretly wipes away. In the meantime, the tumult that is also described in the novel ensues, and which William wants to use to get away. However, he runs into Gui, who enters the chapter house with a great pose and explains that he has caught the murderer, but unfortunately not before he has murdered again. As in the novel, William examines Severin's body and notices that he is wearing gloves. That the emulary sphere is as a murder weapon fits back to the trumpets of the apocalypse is not mentioned. Gui's trial also takes place in a similar way to the novel. But here it's not Gui alone who holds the court. He gets two assessors, the abbot and William of Baskerville. Gui accuses Remigius of heresy and murder and after an interrogation, again greatly cut down, he demands that his judges confirm his verdict. The abbot confirms, but William only confirms the heresy but insists that Remigius had nothing to do with the murderers. Only then does Gui insist that Remigius should be tortured, which causes Remigius to break down and confess. But the forced confession infuriates William even more. Well then, burn brother Remigio, but don't think that this is the end of the murder spree that has drenched the abbey's reputation in blood. More bodies will be found and they too will have blackened fingers and blackened tongues. In response, Gui orders William to be arrested and brought before the Pope for repeatedly daring to contradict the Inquisitor. At the same time, the papal delegation declares the dispute over, because one can see that the Franciscans are nothing more than a homestead of friends of heretics. So instead of the sophisticated intrigues that Echo weaves in his novel, it is pretty clumsily William's fault that the dispute broke up. Both delegations are now leaving. Ubertin's flight is also in the film, but it's built in earlier. Just the announcement that Bernard Gui is coming to the Abbot lets the Franciscans arrange everything. We also see Ubertin hiding in a barrel on top of a horse-drawn cart. All of this takes place immediately after William's conversation with the Abbot before Gui arrives. Choche's sermon was also used in the film, but it doesn't take place until the next day. Here again two scenes from the novel were combined. And it's of course again heavily shortened. In the sermon Choche says that the task of the library is to preserve knowledge. Because I said preservation, not the search for something new. There is no new knowledge. Just a, shall we say, Wonderful repetition. This corresponds entirely with the doctrine that the Bible contains the ultimate truth and that one cannot learn more. A scene during the court hearing was also incorporated into the film in which Azzo begs the Virgin Mary in the church for help for the rose. Now we have to turn our attention to the Gordian knot of the adaptation in this series. The authors have broken the dispute into two parts in order to be able to run parallel storylines that actually follow one after another in the novel. In addition, Anna was inserted in the plot. I'll try to summarize it as best as I can as not to confuse the willing viewer too much. And I realize I've tried that many times in this series, but I'm not sure if I've succeeded. Well, all right then. The first part of the dispute takes place in a series just before the Rose falls into Salvatore's trap. However, the dispute is intensified. Instead of the participants throwing insults at each other, there is a real fight. Azzo then confesses to William that he violated the vow of celibacy. While Salvatore locks the Rose in the paper mill and returns to the Abbey, Anna wakes up in the forest to find the rose gone. Azzo meets Salvatore in the abbey by the horse stables, who tries to distract Azzo from the bundle he is carrying by drawing the novice's attention to that third horse here. 
that is not as good as the abbots. However, Azzo still sees the black cat, as does Malachias. Anna secretly enters the abbey. First she meets Azzo, whom she tells that the rose has disappeared. Then she talks to Remigius. She wants the letters from her father, the documents of Fra Dolcino. Remigius goes to Malachias, who has kept them in the library, but he claims he has them no longer. The second part of the dispute begins when Severin comes and tells William that he has found the book. William has a speech to make though, so he tells Severin to lock himself up and make sure nobody gets those documents. Azzo is to keep watch in the yard. He observes Remigius, who is just walking around. He thinks Severin is safe and returns to the chapter house. As in the novel, the dispute is shortly afterwards interrupted by the news that Severin has been murdered and Remigius has been arrested as the murderer. In Severin's laboratory, however, Remigius does not turn to Malachias, but to Azzo. He hugs him and whispers to him to warn Anna. Now two things are running parallel again. Bernagui is interrogating Remigius, whereby a lot of the scene has been taken from the book, while William and Azzo are investigating Severin's laboratory. As in the novel, William makes the connection from the Amillary Sphere to the Trumpet of the Apocalypse, and Benno is there and reports that Malachias must have been there before. Benno also laughs when Azzo holds the right book in his hands and William doesn't recognize it. Also at the same time, Salvatore arrives at the paper mill and wants to perform the magic ritual on the rose so that she falls for him. However, Malachias has reported Salvatore to Gui. Gui still wants a confirmation and has Remigius tortured. Meanwhile, Azzo makes his way to the paper mill having realized who must be responsible for the Rose's disappearance. While the court case continues, Guy's guards also make their way to the paper mill. The fight between Azzo and Salvatore takes place. Azzo falls into the mill stream just in time before Guy's guards come in and arrest Salvatore and the girl. After the prisoners arrive at the abbey, Azzo also comes back with a pretty nasty wound on his head. Salvatore is now also being tortured. The next day the trial continues while Anna roams the abbey in search of Gui. As in the novel, the fact that Remigius was found in Severin's laboratory is due to a misunderstanding. Gui received the letters that Dolcino gave to Remigius from Malachias. Remigius reiterates his beliefs about why he belonged to Dolcino's gang and this is where the strangest scene in the series occurs. Jorge doesn't want to listen to the whole thing anymore. Neither does Azzo, so he escorts the blind man out. A conversation ensues between Azzo and Jorge in which Azzo asks the old monk to give the rose absolution. Which he actually does. He goes into the dungeon with Azzo says he doesn't sense anything bad in the girl and pronounces absolution. I have a suspicion that this was built in to distract from Jorge's role in the story. But it falls totally out of the story. This is not Jorge's character, he wouldn't do that, not even for a distraction. The rest of the trial is like in the novel. Remigius doesn't want to confess the murders, so Gui threatens him with repeated torture. Then he confesses. The verdict is clear. Remigius, Salvatore and the Rose are to be taken to Avignon and burned at the stake. While William and Azzo are talking to Benno and he tells them that he's the new librarian's assistant, Anna breaks into the dungeon and tries to free the Rose, but fails. I mentioned that the film's writers had some inconsistencies because of the shortening of the storyline, but that's nothing compared to the mess the series writers make with the storyline. Three motives for the strong change in the plot clearly emerge here. On the one hand, a strong female character, Anna, should also get something to do. Secondly, the plot should be lengthened in such a way that there are 8 episodes of around 50 minutes each and each episode can end with a cliffhanger. 
Thirdly, and this is particularly noticeable during the court hearing, the pacing should probably be changed, since scenes in which there is a lot of talk alternate with scenes in which action takes place. I personally think that they didn't do themselves a favor here, since the series suffers from what you've already seen in other series. The scenes don't seem lengthened, but stretched. Take for example the scene with Jorge giving absolution to the Rose. This scene goes nowhere and could have been left out. Also the failed rescue attempt that Anna carries out. It's almost like in an old TV series. You can do whatever you want during an episode, but at the end you have to be on square one again. In that case the ending is predetermined because the core of the plot would have imploded if Anna had managed to free the Rose. So that must not happen, which is why the escape attempt had to fail. Here too nothing would change if the scene was cut out, except for the running time of the episode. It's a shame, because on the other hand, there are very good insertions into the series. For example, Bernard Gouy doesn't have any instruments of torture with him, so he has the tools of the Abbey's blacksmith confiscated. At night, the screams of the tortured Remedius and Salvatore can be heard through the buildings, so the monks come out of their cells in the corridor, and the blacksmith angrily shouts, they torture him with my tools. The movie has the stronger realism compared to the series. I would like to mention Anna again, who invades the Abbey, disguises herself and secretly roams everywhere. I've already made the comparison with a fantasy film. The scenes here reminded me very much of Robin Hood. As for the prisoners, the movie is more realistic and closer to the description in the novel since Salvatore is first arrested and tortured here. You can see the traces of torture very clearly during the court hearing. As described in the novel, it can be seen in the scene that Salvatore's wrists were probably broken during the torture and that his hands are completely twisted. So, these were the events of the fifth day. We are heading inevitably towards the climax. Watch out for the sixth trumpet.